We're happy to welcome uh, Emil Rendersbacher as our speaker today. Emil has gardened for 20 years, uh, and he's been a master gardener for 10. He was uh, a frequent guest and an occasional host on his brother's lawn and garden show on KXIC. And uh, he's given over 40 presentations on gardening in the Iowa City area. Today, he's going to share with us his thoughts on fall gardening. Perhaps his suggestions will make a difference in our spring gardens next spring. Amol. Um, as Melanie said, I've been gardening for about 20 years. I garden, I'm a passionate flower gardener. And I, um, this is my passion, but gradually my brother, Ed, has convinced me that I need to know more about woody materials. And so um, he told me last year that in five years, Amel, you won't have any perennials. It'll all be uh, dwarf conifers in your garden. Well, we'll see. <laughs> At any rate, um, I garden on an acre and a half north of Iowa City. I have uh, lots of flowers. I've planted over 50 different varieties in trees and shrubs. So it's a fairly large garden. As I get older, I wonder why I have such a large <laughs> garden. But it's been a beautiful fall, a beautiful fall. And I, I love fall. It's one of my favorite seasons. As the dog days of summer move into the warm days, cool nights of, of autumn, it's, it's just my favorite time of year. Uh, for me, fall is about serious planting, serious soil preparation, improvement, some garden cleanup, and getting ready for spring. I think that's the most important thing. I'm much mellower in the fall as a gardener. Um, you know, in early spring, I'm just excited. I want to get out there, and I want to dig, and I want to plant, and I want to clean, and I want to do all these things. And then by late spring, early summer, I call it garden anxiety has crept over me. And I just, oh my god, I'm not going to get my list done before the hot, uh, hostile summer days arrive. And then in the fall, I just sort of mellow out. And it's wonderful. Uh, I make decisions easier. I'm more flexible. And I work at a much saner pace in the garden. And if uh, I don't get something done, then that's OK, because uh, I can get it done in the spring. Well, there's a lot to be done in the garden. And today, I want to share with you my list of garden tasks, some of the things I've already done, some of the things I did yesterday, some of the things I did this morning. And I've got a little bit more gardening to go. I'll be gardening probably into November uh, this year. So I'm going to spend the next 50 minutes, roughly, kind of going over some of these things. Um, my handout, the buff handout, actually is my outline of my presentation. So, and I'll talk about this handout at the end. I took this this week in my garden. I love the fall, the colors, the smells, the Hawkeyes. I love it all. It's my favorite time of year. Um, lawn's a little ratty, but you can kind of see things. You know, this early frost that we had in late September, usually the first frost, killing frost, is about this weekend, second week of October. But we had a little bit early this year, and that cut down some of these things, so it's not quite as attractive. This is an ornamental grass. I love the grasses. This is a Joe Pye weed that when the frost hit, looks dead, but it was beautiful at one time. This is a fall blooming perennial. This was taken a couple years ago. I'll show you some more. This is a, one of my flower borders. And then the Freeman maples. The trees are just gorgeous. The white ash this year, I think, are the prettiest I've ever seen it. So what are the fall garden tasks I'm going to talk about? Clean up, soil preparation. What are you going to do in your lawn? It's planting time. Trees, shrubs, bulbs, water. And we'll talk about winter protection. Let's put this into context. You can still plant trees and shrubs right now. This is a great time to do it. The soil temperatures are cooling down, perfect for root development. That's why it's wonderful to plant in the spring and in the fall. It's great for root development. And as long as you can work the ground, you can plant trees. I'd say, you know, into November. We talked about the first killing frost. 
The, it's the freezing and thawing that kills plants. We have, and that's where we're going to talk about winter protection. And winter protection is especially new, important for new plants. And one thing I didn't put on here is the first hard freeze we get in this area is generally the late October, early November. And that, that will be important when we apply winter mulch. Okay. Cleaning up plant debris. Really, cutting down perennials is strictly a matter of taste and preference. For me, it's a matter of practicality. I just don't do it. I have too many. I just don't do it. Uh, I do a couple things. There's an exception. But, you know, some plant material adds a visual interest in the garden. Uh, ornamental grasses, cone flowers, and also provides shelter for birds, food and shelter for birds. And so I just don't cut much down. Um, also, I think spent foliage provides insulation for certain kinds of perennials. Mums, for example, uh, ferns, some asters. I would just, I would leave, I would not cut that, that, that material down. And then removing seed stalks of self-seeders reduces weeding. So if there, there are things that are voracious seeders like asters and cone flowers and you want to cut them down because in the spring you will have a thousand times that many, then that might be something that you do. I'm going to show you four slides I took about three years ago. I have a perennial bed that's 120 feet, uh, kind of a semicircle behind my house. And I want to show you, I garden, I want to garden all year round. I want to see this garden all year round from my windows. I want to see it in the winter. I want to see it in the spring. And so I start with early bulbs. I go to the, uh, a little bit later in the, uh, in the spring. Later in the summer, you can see the cone flowers are coming up. This is in August. You see the rattlesnake master here. This is the grass called Blondo. You can see the hardy pampas grass in the middle. And here is after the first hard freeze. So the plant material's kind of gotten uh, brown. I like it. Then here it is in the winter. Visual interest rather than just flat snow. Now you notice, oh, you don't see any. There's a few dwarf conifers in there, compliments of my brother, which also provides winter interest. Okay. I don't remember planting this. I say this to myself all the time in the, in the spring. And this is an example. I didn't plant any of these asters. I took this Tuesday. This is the uh, front walk to my house. These are self-seeders. This is a purple dome, I think, aster. They were planted in my back bed. And you can see, I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, the deer like to munch them down. They kind of keep them under control. But they're beautiful. They're still blooming now. But this is an example of something that if you don't want this many of, you should pull them out or cut the seed heads off this winter. Okay? Continuing on with cleanup, I do dispose of disease foliage, particularly on iris. This is very important. They have fungal diseases and all this, also this iris borer. And if you've ever had iris borer, you know what I mean, that you want to clean this up now because uh, the eggs... Um, the critters deposit the eggs in the, in the dead foliage. And if you can get rid of that stuff right this fall, then you won't, you won't have this problem. I dug up all my iris last year, and it was a monumental undertaking, and it was awful. I never want to do it again. And so I always cut my iris back, almost all the way to the ground in the fall, and get rid of that foliage. Also, vegetable refuse, particularly tomatoes uh, plants, you need to get rid of. And... Uh, I suppose you could bury it, burn it, or those of you who live in town, send it to wherever they send stuff that you bag up, okay? Don't prune subshrubs. Subshrubs are things that are, are shrubs in other parts. They're not quite here, like artemisias, like uh, Russian sage, uh, butterfly bush, the budalea. Those are kind of subshrubs. So you don't want to prune those off because they grow from, if we have a, a, a a milder winter, you're going to get some, you can get some growth on those um, from some of those um, stems. And b don't bag your leaves. Recycle your leaves in your yard, please. Um, when I moved to my new house, I had no trees. I had an acre and a half of no trees. Okay, so I had no leaves. And I still don't have very many leaves. And so I get leaves from my friends in town. I give them bags, they rake them, they bag them, and then they give them to me. 
There are two people in this audience that have given me their leaves. I, I appreciate that because then I use them as compost in my garden or as mulch. So what I would do with the leaves, chop them up with a mower, with a weed eater, with a shredder, either compost them, till them in to your gardens, or mulch with them, okay? Oak is the best, but if you have uh, maple leaves, you really need to chop them up because they'll really layer and kind of form an impenetrable barrier, okay? But so chop them up. And you get kind of a 10 to one ratio on this. So I just, I rake my leaves in a pile, I just run my mower over it several times and it'll reduce it by, you know, 10 times. Okay, so that's important. Okay, example of iris foliage needs to be cut, I pull that off, I cut it back all the way to the ground, I clean it up really well and get rid of it. I have a burn pile, I'm in the county, I burn it. Okay, soils. Establishing soil is the most important thing you can do for your plants. Very most important thing, you should spend time on this. I, I preach this every presentation I give. I love to watch the Victory Garden on TV because those, that soil, you know, they just go in like this and they all the way to their elbow. Beautiful soil, they don't even have to use tools, they plant everything with their hands. Well, I'm sure that guy didn't do that. I mean, he had a crew do that. But uh, the soil is, if you spend time on it, it's gonna it, it pay you back a hundredfold. And fall is the best time to prepare soil, uh, to improve and prepare soil because Fall tillage helps control insects and diseases that overwinter, you know, like black spot and things like that. Uh, the freezing and thawing of the, of the dirt improves the tilth or the aggregation of the soil. So you, that's important. And then also areas that you prepare in the fall dry out quicker. So you can get and work, you can plant things quicker or earlier in the spring. And so that's another advantage. Fall is a good time to test your soil. I always recommend that you do a soil test, particularly in new construction, in new yards. You never know what they've put in the soil when they've built that house or what they've taken out of the soil when they've sold that soil to somebody and you're gonna buy it back most likely. So when I put in my beds, I tested, I, I tested my soil to make sure to see what I was working with. If you live in town, you may not need to do this as much, but it's really important because fall is an excellent time to do that for uh, <coughs> phosphorus, potassium, and also doing a pH. And pH is simply a measure of acidity of the soil. And Iowa, the best soil in the world. It's no secret. Most plants grow best between a pH of six and seven. And that's what Iowa soils generally are, six and seven. Uh, I've never really had to do anything to my soil, even though it was quite disturbed during construction, except add organic matter. And, but it's important, I think, that you test for that. And then incorporate organic matter into your soil. You know, organic matter, good soil is between two and 5% organic matter, that's all. But it's just um, important because it can, it's a source of nitrogen and it provides fertility and, and tilth and aggregation of organic matter. So you've got to add it back because it decomposes, it depletes. And you do that by tilling in leaves, grass clippings, straw. I mulch my vegetable garden with Chronicles of Higher Education. That's a newsprint publication, okay? It's really wonderful because it's a tabloid. It's really thick. And so I just put it on my vegetable garden. I put it on my raspberry patch. Then I put straw over it or grass clippings. And then in the vegetable garden, I just till it in. Yeah, newspaper is organic, it's great, it's wonderful, provides tilth. Okay, rotted manure is a very good way to improve the organic matter of your soil. Leaves, anything like that. So, if you're preparing a new bed, vegetable garden, you can till that stuff in. If you're in flower beds that you don't wanna dig stuff up, you can mulch with it, okay? And always, always add organic matter when you plant things. I always have, I compost all my garden waste and, my, and, my, and much of my uh, um, kitchen waste. And so I always have compost or manure, well-rotted manure available. So whenever I plant something, I put, I mix, put uh, compost or manure into that planting hole. I'm always replenishing the soil in my garden. It's very important. 
And the other thing you can do, especially in a vegetable garden, is plant a cover crop to improve the soil uh, and prevent erosion. Uh, my brother Friday, I was talking to him on the phone, he was planting annual rye in his vegetable garden because he had some left over. But you can use uh, winter rye, winter wheat, I suppose. You know, that is a, a winter crop. It germinates, the seeds germinate about 33 degrees. And so if you're going to plant it, you probably should do it pretty soon. But it's great because it helps with weed control. Uh, and also then, in the spring, you just till it right in. Provides tilth, a source of organic material, source of nitrogen. It's wonderful. Okay. No poet I've ever heard of has written an ode to a load of manure. And somebody should, and I'm not trying to be funny. And this is, uh, I think, really important because manure is is a wonderful product. I love the sweet smell of the Iowa countryside. I'm thinking, ah, yes, it's, it's, it's gold. It's black gold. So, okay, now we're gonna talk about preparing new beds because this is a perfect time. This is a new, this is that uh, 120 foot long perennial bed I was telling you about. And two years ago, I decided I was going to double the size of it. And so this was taken in the fall two years ago. Now, when you're preparing new beds, this is what you need to do. You have to remove the turf if it's in, uh, in turf. And uh, I round things up. I don't have a problem with using Roundup. I think this is, comes from my brother. He's an expert in it, so he's taught me well. And so I round up my grass and, and do it that way. You can, you can smother it with a cardboard or plastic or I know that uh, we were talking at one of our meetings about um, you can also just dump dirt and compost and things like that on top of turf as well. That will kill it. And then you rototill the area or spade it to a depth of six to eight inches. This is what you're doing. You're trying to get rid of the, if you don't strip the sod, which I don't, it's too much work. I just kill it and then I rototill it. Okay. And then I'm going to add soil amendments. And that includes compost, leaves, grass, clippings, manure, peat, something like that. Other, you know, and I also in my beds add soil, topsoil because most of my beds are raised because I have a drainage issue. So I raise mine up, and so I have to add more dirt on top of that, okay? So you add your amendments, it's like a recipe, and then you rototill it again. You're mixing it up, okay? And then if you don't add manure, you should probably put in some dry fertilizer of some sort, like a complete fertilizer, like a 10-10-10, and then rake it in, okay? And then you leave the soil rough. Don't overtill this because you don't want it to blow away during the winter, okay? So it's just not, because the freezing and thawing action will break that down and then water it well. You could plant a cover crop if you want. And some of the areas that I'm not going to get into right away, I might put uh, uh, oak bark, uh, shredded bark on top of it just um, so, because I won't get in it right away in the spring. And that kind of keeps the weeds down. So visual aids here. Here's this bed. I killed it with Roundup. I don't have a lot of courage at first, so I start very small and gradually I get, I just start getting big swaths of Roundup. So I started killing it, brought in my amendments. I used uh, manure and topsoil in this. You can see how it's raised. Um, and then you see this board here? This is really important. I always work in my beds. I never like, walk in them. I walk on a board, a plank of some sort. I have various lengths of planking. And it's, you've worked really hard on this soil to get it really nice for those plant roots. So don't start compacting it, okay? You know, and so I, I would work with a board. Here's the same bed then in the spring. I got into it really early. You can see the other task of this after I did this half is then I renovated this half by digging everything out of it in the spring. And then you can see these, this big pile of dirt here or manure. And then I was just, I was starting to renovate the other half of it. You can see um, I've planted it. Okay. So those are new beds, planting, uh, preparing new beds. Let's talk about lawns. I fortunately have a great lawn person in my family. And so he takes care of my lawn for me. Uh, but I've talked to him a lot about lawn care. It is too late to seed right now. You really need to seed a little bit earlier. But it's not too late to, to sod. Uh, they've been sodding on the pentacrest of the capital, or the old capital, uh, last week. Uh, yesterday, my new neighbors, the new house next to me, they sodded their yard. It's not too late. You can sod until the ground freezes or until it snows. I've seen people sodding in December before. But it's, it's a good time to aerate your yards. 
you can do this now, you can do it in the spring. I prefer to do it in the fall because of those, the plugs that you get. I don't like to tromp around them in the spring. I'd rather do it in the fall because by the spring they're gone, okay? And it's really important to aerate. Uh, you can do this yourself, you can have it done because plants need oxygen. Uh, your roots need oxygen. And one way to do that is um, to take these plugs of, of earth out and that helps the oxygen get to those plant roots. You can spray for broadleaf weeds now until mid-October. Uh, your last fertilizer after uh, last mowing in late October or November, probably an application of nitrogen for the most part. And then of course mow as long as the grass is growing. My grass, the rain yesterday, I mowed yesterday, I'm going to have to probably mow several more weeks. Your last mow should be shorter. I'm mowing right now at three inches. I'll probably cut it down to two, maybe two and a half. I don't know, depending on your yard. I have a tall turf type fescue yard, not bluegrass yard. But it sort of depends on your yard. But it's very important because if you leave your lawn high, you're going to be susceptible to voles. Lee and I were talking about vole damage earlier, but also snow mold disease, which is really a nasty thing. So if you leave a lot of debris in your yard, uh, uh, leaves, or, or, or a high yard, you're going to get some of these uh, fungal diseases in the winter. Okay, let's talk about planting trees and shrubs. It's best to plant evergreens usually mid-August through mid-September. You could do it now. I did it last week. Um, you don't want to get too late because what happens on evergreens is once the ground starts to freeze, then those roots are going to take up enough water. Uh, to keep the, uh, the tree sort of in moisture, and so you're going to get desiccation. But you, can, uh, you probably still could do it, but you need to really water them in good. But deciduous trees and shrubs, these are the kinds of trees that shed their leaves every fall. This is a perfect time to plant, and you can plant as long as you can uh, work the ground, I would say, into mid-November or early November. Let's talk about how to plant a tree. First of all, you dig a large hole, and you dig it only as deep as the root ball, and twice as wide. Most tree roots grow out, they don't grow down. And so um, it's important that you dig, you know, the wider the hole, the better you're going to be off, okay? Prune sparingly. Don't prune new trees. People have, are really, they want to limb these trees up. You don't need to do that. Trees need these limbs to establish girth and to establish the roots. They need to photosynthesize, so they need all the leaves they can get early on. So don't prune it. Only prune off dead stuff or diseased stuff, broken things. Other than that, even if it looks awful, don't prune it. Wait a couple years. Then you should pr prune branches when they're about an inch and a half in diameter, but no, uh, no bigger than two inches in diameter. Okay, That's kind of the, the standard on that. Um, and remember, once you prune off a branch, it's not going to grow back. And so no point in limbing it up when it's younger. You know, wait a while, see what it's going to look like. Then you can start pruning for structure and beauty and whatever. Place the tree at, the pro at a proper height in the planting hole. Uh, okay, this is important. Uh, the number one cause of tree death is planting them too deep. I have a Douglas fir that is slowly dying because the landscape company that I bought it from planted it too deep. It's taken seven years, but now it's in decline. My brother and I did a landscaping job um, last spring and this fall where they planted all the trees too deep. We replaced every one of them. And when you dug it out, it's very easy to see. So this is really important that you monitor this. OK. Um, if you've got this, you're going to have a lot of nursery sales now. And that's good because it's a good time to plant, so you can get some bargains. You're going to get bald and burlap stuff now. You're going to get container-grown things now. So it's important when you plant that that you, you, you take the soil away from the trunk of that tree and see where the basal or the trunk flare is. And that's where the, the trunk, I'll show you this in a minute, that's where the trunk starts to come out. The first root comes out. Because a lot of times when they, bought, when they dig uh, bald trees, they dig them out of the field, and then they just put the burlap and just hike it up like this, and they'll just bring the soil right up on the trunk. And I've had trees where the dirt is this much higher than it should be. Okay? And so if you just plant the tree thinking, oh, this is where it should be planted, you're mistaken. The same thing with container-grown trees, but not as bad in, in some of the container-grown trees. Okay? So then you plant, I, I plant all my trees about a third higher 
than the ground, okay? Just from a drainage standpoint. Because the other thing that's going to kill a tree is it's going to drown. In the floods of 93, a lot of things drowned. Because again, roots need oxygen. Water sits on a tree, around a tree. It's not going to breathe. It's going to die. It's going to drown. And so that's why I plant my trees. In many commercial uh, plantings, you'll see trees planted higher than the ground. And that's OK. And you can go all the way to a third if you want. And then you just kind of mound the soil up like that. OK? But, and you, but you make sure that it's planted at the right height in, on, in terms of on the trunk. And then you backfill with the original soil. A lot of studies done at Iowa State University and other, other land grant institutions about using original soil. If you don't, you end up planting a, it's like a potted plant, okay? So you dig, we've got clay soils in Iowa, so you dig a hole, a wonderful planting hole, and then you fill it with all this really nice rich earth that you bought, okay? And so the roots, you're gonna plant that tree, the roots are gonna say, mm, 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 and they're just gonna shoot out, and then they're gonna hit that clay and stop. It's like a potted plant, okay? So use the original soil. The tree is gonna take a little bit longer to establish, but it's gonna be healthier for it. And then, of course, water it as soon as you plant it, and then continue to water it weekly until the ground freezes. I'm watering everything now that I planted this year, including in the spring. I water it every week, and I measure it. Because water, when you water, you water deeply and thoroughly. You don't just sprinkle it. So I water, I measure everything in five-gallon buckets so I know exactly how much water my plant material is getting. It doesn't take any longer to do it that way. And then mulch, mulch it. Studies show that trees that are mulched are healthier. They grow faster. Uh, I can go on and on about mulch. I will preach mulch. And then you stake it if necessary. If you don't need to stake it, don't stake it. No reason to stake it. You'd stake it because it might be really tall, okay, whip in the wind. It might have a lot of uh, leaves on it. I planted a white oak one time that was just, or a swamp white oak that was just like top heavy almost. Um, Anything that, because you're gonna have these stakes, are gonna um, stabilize it until the roots take hold. But once you plant it, it's got a big enough root ball, you don't need to stake it, don't stake it. And then only leave the stakes on for about a year. And you can tell, I just took a bunch of stakes off yesterday. You know, just take the trunk and wiggle it and see if it's taken hold. If it has, it doesn't need to be staked anymore. Okay. Visual aids. Well set tree root ball. Look how wide the hole is. Now if you end up digging your hole too deep, then you've got to fill it back in here and tamp that soil down because you don't want that tree to settle. This is planted slightly above grade. I would plant it even higher than that. Okay. And then you want to mulch it. You don't want to, here's the trunk flare. You can, so you want to make sure this is right there. The first root comes out here. Okay. And then mulch it. You don't want the mulch to touch the uh, trunk. Here, I, this is my, I planted this beech tree a couple years ago, and I took these slides. I did it by myself, so I used a little two-wheeler to get it out in the yard. <clears throat> and then my brother taught me this trick. So I have a big tarp that I lay out. So I keep my yard kind of tidy, and I, uh, so I don't have to get any more soil. I dig the hole. I put all the soil onto this tarp. I use a spade. That's my gardening tool of choice. No matter what I'm doing, this is the spade I use. Uh, shovel to kind of clear out the hole a little bit. But you see I've got it wider than it is deep. Okay, and this is clay. Oop, I just lost my mic. Okay, now to ensure that I don't plant it too deep, I have this bamboo pole that I just put across the hole so I can kind of see what I'm doing and making sure that, that, the, um, that the ball isn't too deep. I filled it in with the original soil. Notice how clean that carpet of grass is. And then I've mulched it. So 